Hello, and uh, welcome to Chalking True Crime with um, NewsQuest Investigates. I'm Charles Thompson, the London uh, Investigations reporter for NewsQuest. Uh, today we're going to be talking about a very interesting uh, case, a uh, murder case, which is uh, the subject of constant um, speculation and media coverage over whether or not it was a miscarriage of justice. So in summer 2003, a 14-year-old schoolgirl called Jodie Jones was savagely murdered in broad daylight in the Scottish town of Dalkeith. She'd been beaten, strangled, had clumps of her hair pulled out, and her throat had been slashed up to 20 times. Jodie's mutilated body was found by a search party that night, which comprised of some members of her family and her 14-year-old boyfriend, Luke Mitchell. Jodie had left home that evening to meet Luke in roughly the area where her body was found, which was along a woodland path that ran between their homes. And when Luke reported that she'd never arrived, he and her family had gone looking for her. But the police began treating Luke as a suspect that night. They couldn't find any forensic evidence that linked him to Jody's murder, either at the crime scene, on his body, or at his own home. But eyewitness testimony placed Jody and Luke together that evening near the woodland, contradicting his account that she had never arrived for their meeting. The authorities and the media contended that he was a likely killer because he listened to Marilyn Manson music and he was apparently fascinated with an unsolved murder case in America known as the Black Dahlia killing. They suggested that he had tried to recreate the Black Dahlia killing by murdering Jody. They took Luke to trial based on a circumstantial case and he was convicted by a majority verdict. Now aged 16, he was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 20 years, and his 20 years in prison are now almost up. However, he's unlikely to ever be released unless his conviction is overturned by the courts because he refuses to admit that he committed the crime. He insists that he is innocent. He said in 2021, I will not admit to something I've not done. I want to clear my name. They will not bully a false admission of guilt out of me. Our guest today is Dr. Sandra Lean, who has devoted years of her life to trying to overturn Luke Mitchell's conviction. Dr. Lean has an honors degree in psychology and sociology. She's qualified as a specialist paralegal with Strathclyde University, and she has a PhD in criminology. She wrote her thesis on miscarriages of justice. Hi, Sandra. How are you doing? Hi, I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. It's a fascinating case and one that you've devoted years to. How many years have you been working on this case now? 20. 20 <clears> years. Just over 20, yeah. So how did you actually get involved in this case to begin with? It was, I, I live, at, at the time I lived about half a mile from where Jodie was found. My eldest daughter went to the high school. Jodie was found the wall runs behind the high school where my daughter attended. Um, we are just a, a, a series of little villages and the, everybody says it, but nothing like that happens here. So initially it was just fear. And then the, the local hysteria, the, the local, the, the focus on Luke so quickly and, and local hysteria, I started to think, hang on, what if everybody's so hysterical about this lad and it's not him. You know, the kids are still going about, what if it's not him? Um, and a few weeks in, maybe about six weeks in, um, Luke's mum heard about my take, which was, was not a popular opinion in the area at the time, not at all. Everybody, it was him. Everybody thought he was the killer. Um, she put a note through the, the door of my workplace saying, can you help us? And to be honest, I knew nothing about wrongful convictions or, you know, the law or anything. I thought, how on earth can I help them? And initially it was just being supportive and trying to find things out. When, when things were happening with the case and we thought that's strange, I'd go and try and find out if that was normal or if it was unusual. And, and it just started from there. So let's talk a bit about how Luke became a suspect. So Jodie's body is found by a search party, which comprises Luke and several members of her family. 
they've all gone looking because he says that she has not showed up for their arranged meeting. Um, now, the police decided that he had known where the body was and had led the search party to the body. Um, so can you talk us through how the police arrived at that conclusion? Yeah, the the police were called to Jodie's mum's house. And when you said earlier that Jodie was found roughly the area where they were due to meet, actually Jodie was due to go down to Luke's house. So, you know, a, a good bit further down um, and was, was killed on the way rather than in the area they were meant to meet. But the police... Um, when they arrived at the scene, they appeared to be of the opinion that Luke and Luke alone had found the body and the three family, the three other members of the search party, the Jodie's family members, had arrived after Luke found the body. But they'd, they'd left Jodie's mum's house, they'd gone for the missing person details, and they'd left her mum's house under three sort of mistaken pieces of information. So one was that Luke was coming up the path on his bike. And one was that Luke was the only one out searching, which of course is, is why um, they then assumed that the, the other three members had turned up later because Luke was the only one out searching. And the other one, which we've never got to the bottom of, is that the police believe that Jodie had left her own home with Luke at tea time that evening. And now he was saying he hadn't seen her. So if you take those three pieces together, you can see why they were suspicious. Why would he get off his bike on a, a little track in the middle of nowhere, in the dark, and hop over a wall? But he wasn't on his bike. He, he was walking with his dog. And he wasn't on his own because the other he, by then he'd met up with the other three members of the search party who'd suggested a double check. And it was the four of them that were there when Jodie's body was found. Also, his dog alerted, the, the dog was trained to be a tracker, and she alerted past this wee break in the wall. She jumped up and she was scrabbling at the wall and ear sniffing. So Luke doubled back and went over the wall at the V break, which is the only bit really you could have gotten over the wall at that bit. It's about seven feet high. Um, turned towards where the dog reacted and found Jodie, called it, I think there's something here. That was the story of the other members of the search party for a full month. The whole of the month of July, that was their story as well. And then at the end of July, their story started to change. And they started to say that the dog had done nothing. Luke hadn't passed the V point. He'd just gone straight there and over the wall. So, so did the police believe that night that Luke had gone straight to the body or was it after the search trio changed the stories? It's really difficult to figure out, but that was yeah. the end result. So it's an interesting discrepancy that you highlight there, that initially all of the search party were telling the same story, which was yes. that the dog alerted to the body, and then Luke went to investigate what the dog had discovered. But by the time they all arrived at court, um, they were testifying to new statements which have been written later which erased the dog yes. from the story so they had all identically changed their stories yes have you looked into that or how that happened i've seen all the statements as they developed over time um there was a pair of liaison officers that worked with Jodie's family the whole time. And if you piece the statements together, in the same day, they go from one witness to the next, to the next, to the next. And you can actually watch the stories developing. And I think the only conclusion I can draw is that, that the police were introducing doubt about their original statements, maybe saying, oh, well, you know, this one said this is what happened and then when they go to the next one the next one goes oh they might be right maybe i've got it wrong and it's that sense of you, you can watch the stories developing through the different statements so my personal belief is is that they were influenced so in you've only got the statements not the tape recorded there were yeah. no tape recordings made when the statements were being taken there may well have been but if there were the defense didn't have they've not been disclosed Okay. 
So once the police start looking into Luke, um, they decide that he's a pretty curious character. He has said in the past, I was the local weirdo. It was easy to put it on me and make people believe these nasty, evil things about me. So the things that they uncovered were that he was um, a dope smoker. Is that right? Yeah. Um, he was, for some reason, storing jars of his own urine. It has uh, been claimed. Was that, that correct? After, that came after the murder. And, oh, that was after that, the murder. Yeah, yeah. That has been explained by a psychologist as um, a trauma reaction, an OCD reaction. After and the then they, f they found evidence of what they said was devil worship or Satanism. For example, he'd written things down on journals. He'd written on one. I offer my flesh, blood, and soul to the Dark Lord of Hell. Um, so have you spoken to Luke about these uh, things that he'd written down and uh, what his beliefs were and why he was doing that? Yes, so a, a number of the, the scribbles on the jotters were actually um, from a computer game. They were quotes from a, a computer game. And the rest were pretty much like dozens of other teenagers scribble ridiculous things on the jotters. Um, you know, he didn't mean he believed any of them. He, he was just trying to be an edgy teenager, basically. Well, this was something that happened a lot in the 90s and the 80s, actually, which was that people would be identified as suspects in crimes because they listened to heavy metal music. It would be alleged yeah. that there were subliminal messages in the music Marilyn Manson himself was blamed for the Columbine massacre. And of course, Marilyn Manson came into play in this case. And there was some link drawn between Marilyn Manson and the Black Dahlia killing in America in the 1940s. So uh, something that's confused me when I've been reading about the case is whether there was any evidence that Luke himself had an interest in the Black Dahlia case or whether they were saying that Manson was known to be obsessed with the Dahlia case and he was a fan of Manson. So what's the, the story there between Luke and the Black Dahlia case? The, the, the claim was that um, he was fanatical about Marilyn Manson and as a result, he'd seen Marilyn Manson's watercolour paintings of the Black Dahlia killing and used modelled the murder on those. The problem they have is that he wasn't a Marilyn Manson fan, <laughs> far less obsessed with him. Um, he had one CD that was bought after Jody was murdered and one calendar that was ripped up in the bin. That was it, he wasn't, put and, and if you look at the police questioning, they introduce Manson over and over and over again. They keep asking him about his music and he likes Eminem and, you know, and they keep asking him about Manson. And he says, well, Jody likes him, I'm not that keen on him. And that somehow becomes an obsession. But when it comes to the watercolour paintings, they took every computer he had access to. And there was no evidence that he had ever accessed the website that these paintings were on. And the, the officer doing this particular bit of the, the, the job said they were really difficult to find. You would only find them if you knew what you were looking for. And so the allegation, just to be clear, was that Marilyn Manson had done some paintings which were inspired by the Black Dahlia killing yeah. and that Luke was trying to recreate those paintings of the killing yeah. and did so by re by killing Jody. That was the theory. Yeah. But you're saying there is no evidence in existence that he had ever seen the paintings no. that he was accused of trying to copy. No. And the pathologist later said the the the, the um, similarities between the two murders were superficial in, in as much as there were slashing injuries to both victims but that they're not it, it's in no way a copycat and there was no evidence of luke having a book about the black dahlia killings no. or or um, visiting Black Dahlia websites, for example. Mm. There was no independent evidence separate from Marilyn Manson of him having an interest in the Dahlia case. No, no. Okay. I, I remember when that came up um, in the lead up to trial and Luke's mum was saying, you know, what's the Black Dahlia? What's that all about? And we were all sitting there going, not got a clue. You know, I'd just never heard of it until then. So. No, there was, there was nothing to suggest that he had, he had any knowledge 
about any of it and certainly not that he'd seen the pictures. Now, when the police went um, door to door in Luke's neighbourhood, they spoke to some neighbours who said that they smelled the family's log burner going that evening. And yeah. so the police developed a theory that um, Luke's mother had helped him to destroy the clothing that he was wearing when he committed the crime. And they actually charged her with, uh, they charged her as an accessory and accused her of doing that. And they said that Luke's Parker coat was missing. Mm -hmm. So is there an explanation for the missing Parker coat? Yes, there is no missing Parker. <laughs> it's it's so difficult. That there's so much in this case that just appears to have been plucked out of nowhere. Um, the, when the police came on the 4th of July, so Jodie was murdered on the 30th, the night of the 30th of June, and they found her just going into the morning of 1st July. On the 4th of July, they raided Luke's house, Luke's mum's house, and he was taken in for questioning. And they, they took just about every article of clothing he owned, apart from the stuff that he was in, in the police station. They just took everything. So he had he had nothing to wear. And his mum went shopping on the either the Tuesday or the Wednesday the following week. Um, and this parka jacket was part of the clothing that she bought for him that day. The liaison officer was waiting when she got home and asked for the receipt for all the clothing. So they said that this, this new parka, eventually they said that this new parka was a replacement for the one he'd worn on the night Jody was murdered and it had been burned in the log burner to destroy evidence. And again, they, they, they tripped themselves up because there's also supposed evidence of a sighting of Luke on the main new battle road, out in the open, in broad daylight, standing against a gate, cars going up and down, people seeing him in a parka jacket with no blood, no anything, not agitated or anything like that. So they, they claim at the time was the murderer would have been covered in blood. There's no blood on this jacket that these witnesses see. But then they claim that you had to burn it in the log burner to get rid of evidence. They then took the log burner and all its contents and forensically tested them as well. And there was no evidence of any clothing having been burned there. Nothing. Now, although Luke is taken in for questioning on the 4th, um, he was also taken to the police station on the night of Jody's body being discovered. Yes. Um, and there were some forensic tests done there. Is that correct? I'll come to those later. But they, so the forensic tests of the fingernails and the hair and things like that, that was all yes. done on the night. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'll come back to that. So, um, so you've got the, the neighbors who say they smell the log burner. And then you have these eyewitnesses who come forward. Now, there's a couple of eyewitnesses who say that they saw Luke uh, standing around the entrance to the woodland path. Um, I'm not sure how important that is, to be honest, because his story is that he was supposed to meet Jody and she didn't show up. So it would be quite feasible for him to be standing on his own at the end of that path anyway, wouldn't it? For... He, he hadn't planned to meet her there. He planned, that's what I was saying earlier, he planned to meet her. So Further she was coming to the street. house. Yeah, yeah, or down down to the end of his street. Um, the, so, the important one is the witness at the other end, because she became the central. But the eyewitness at the other end, she became the central witness. And that's the witness who says she saw Luke and Jody together. Yes. So, and that contradicts his story because he says Jody never arrived. Yeah. And they have this witness who says I saw him and Jody together. Um. Now. An important question is, did this witness come forward before or after Luke's picture had been all over the papers? Before. Before his picture had been all over the papers. Yes. She picked him out of a, an ID parade. Was that a photo ID parade? It was a photo ID which has been uh, criticised extensively because uh, all the other boys were younger, had short hair, and a picture, a Polaroid picture of Luke on a white background was inserted into the spread. And when so it was a different, out, different type of picture. Yes. He was a different age to everybody else in the lineup yes. and he had a different appearance than everybody else in the lineup. Yes. So if it was almost like they were pointing out the person that looks different to everyone else in the lineup. Yeah. But then when this witness comes to trial, 
they say, do you see the boy that you saw that day in the courtroom? And she's unable to pick him out in the courtroom. Yeah, she couldn't identify him. Okay. So evidentially that doesn't sound very strong. Um, and yet they did win a conviction, albeit with a, a majority verdict. So how do you think that the jury arrived? Is there anything that we have missed out here? Is there some smoking gun we've missed out? We've got, they say that he's a bit strange. We've got an eyewitness who says she saw them together, but then can't identify him in court. And we've got somebody that smelled a log burner. What mm -hmm. What am I missing? Um, they didn't believe his alibi. His mom and of course, the alibi. Brother. So his mum and brother gave him an alibi initially. Mm -hmm. But when the case came to court, the brother changed his story and rescinded the alibi. Is that correct? That's that's how the media would like to portray it. Um, he was saying initially at trial that Luke was there and the police afterwards re refused to accept the brother's um, statements that Luke was there and kept saying that the brother was lying and threatening that he was going to go to jail. And so, so he's trying to say this on the stand. And what they did was that horrible, horrible, dirty trick. They basically put the pictures of Ju Jody's mutilated body in front of him with no warning and said, this is what we're dealing with. This is what the truth is. This is why we need the truth. And he almost passed out. You know, he, he, he was really, really shaken because he hadn't seen those pictures. Um, and then they started putting things to him like, you know, is it possible you were looking at porn? Is it possible you were, you know, unaware that Luke was out? And, and he just kept agreeing it was possible. He never actually said, yes, that's the case. So, so, so he didn't yeah. rescind as such. He never said, I was lying. Luke no. wasn't there. He no. said, it's possible I'm mistaken. Yeah. Okay. There's a big factor in this case, which is important, I think, to address. And that is that long before Luke came to trial, the media identified him as the suspect. Yes. In a way that, um, for example, since the Cliff Richard case would probably not happen now. And since the Christopher Jeffrey case. Uh, yeah, he was a child. Jeffries, he was a child. Yes. So... Um, his mother described him once as an innocent little boy dragged from his home, having done nothing wrong and then been turned into a monster by the press. And you yourself, has called, you've called the press coverage hysterical and relentless. Yeah. So um, just starting with the basic fact that Luke was named as the suspect, um, do you think that that had the potential to taint the jury pool before the case even came to trial. Absolutely. Um, Edinburgh is about seven miles from here. And lots and lots of people from these villages around about here travel to Edinburgh to work. So it was, when I say relentless, it was daily. This case was never out of the papers the, the whole time, the whole 19 months, with the exception of the little bit where they arrested him and said he couldn't be named because he hadn't turned 16 yet. For a couple of months. Um, aside, aside from that, it was constantly, constantly, constantly in the newspapers, on TV, his picture constantly shown. Some of the stories that were going around this area, it, it just grew arms and legs. It was horrendous. Um, I I don't think they couldn't have got a, a jury pool that, that hadn't been subjected to that. So the relevance of Edinburgh is that's where the trial was and that's where the oh, jury yes. was drawn from. Yeah, of course, this was the, the subject jury... of national news coverage, wasn't it? Yeah, the, the jury pool was actually, um, it wasn't just drawn from Edinburgh. It was, it was drawn from this area as well. They, they only excluded people with postcodes, um, I think, related to Jodie's village, Luke's village and... The high school so so they were they were pulling people from the villages all around here 
So what would be, because this, as I said, this was the subject of national coverage in uh, Scotland. It wasn't just local newspaper coverage. So everywhere in the country, people were talking about this case. Um, what are some of the things that you remember being written about Luke while he was still a suspect before they imposed that ban on um, discussing him once he was arrested? Um, it, it was all implication. It was all innuendo. Um, I remember one, one headline, Luke, who's back? L-U-K-A, who's back? Because Luke had gone back to school. And, and this massive picture of it, well, he's a, he's a 15 year old kid going back to school. Why is that headline news? Um, every article about any development in the case ended with Jodie's boyfriend is the only person who's been questioned. Jodie's boyfriend, she was going to meet him that night and he, he says she never turned up. You know, um, it, it was all it was all kind of pointing the finger in that direction without directly saying it was him. So His picture way... was used constantly, wasn't it? Oh, yes. Um, yes. And they had this one picture where he had like a headband on with yeah. his hair hanging down his face and he he was sort of looking down and looking up like that and it sort of made him look a bit sinister and they used that picture ad nauseum. But yeah. there, there was also the Sky News interview that I wanted to touch on. So Luke couldn't go to the funeral and the reason he couldn't go to the funeral uh, that's been given is that the media was chasing him around and focusing on him so relentlessly that if he showed up at the funeral, it would cause some sort of feeding frenzy, which would distract from the the solemnity of the event. Um, and so a reporter shows up and knocks on the door to um, see if they can talk to Luke. And his mum has said in the past that the, the press coverage so far had been so prejudicial that she was sort of talked into letting this guy into the house to do the interview because she thought that it would help re rewrite the ship, as it were. Um, so, but the reaction to that Sky News interview was actually extremely bad. Um, mm. And one of the headlines was, how dare you? Which when you talk about innu innuendo and implication, I mean, if he's not guilty, then why would the headline be a how dare you? So it's yeah. certainly suggesting that he's done something wrong, that he mm -hmm. shouldn't be talking about Jody, that he's some sort of bad characters. But uh, what do you remember about the reaction to the Sky News interview? It was, th there were two things about the, the reaction. The first was um, the, the absolute condemnation that he'd had the audacity to, to speak to a reporter, how dare he? Um, the, the, the interview was done in such a way that the interviewer was asking questions that the police would have had to ask under caution. So we asked Luke directly, did you kill Jodie? And he's checking out if Luke's got an alibi and if his friends are gonna vouch for him. And, and then people watching this all turned into body language experts and, and you know, that sort of thing. Or you could see in his eyes that he was hiding something. So that was a local reaction. But from that came, his mum had her arm round his shoulder. And from that came the, um, the story that the, the, the relationship between mother and son was unnatural. And boom, there goes yet another really, really negative story thrown into the mix that the, the police then said that they found Luke and his mum sleeping in the same bedroom to, to bolster this story. No, they didn't actually. They found them both sleeping in the living room because Luke was heavily medicated and he was sleeping on the, st the settee in case he fell down the stairs. And his mum slept on the other settee in case he got up and started wandering about in the night. They turned that into, they found them sleeping in the same bedroom. And that's because there was an unnatural relationship because she had an arm around him stroking his, his neck while he did the Sky interview. That was a very extraordinary element of the media coverage, I have to mm -hmm. say. It was it was absolutely extraordinary, the, the way they tried to insinuate that yeah. there was some kind of improper relationship going on between mother and son. It was, it was unbelievable. Why yeah. was he heavily medicated, though, what was going on at that point? Well, it was only 
It was not long after the murder, and he'd been heavily medicated from the day after he found the body. Because you've got to remember, he found the body in those circumstances. He's 14. He's then taken straight to the police station, stripped, swabbed, everything else, questioned overnight, no check on, on his mental or emotional state, questioned right throughout the night. And then it was the following morning, the GP prescribed basically tranquilizers um, to, to, I suppose, to avoid him seeing what he'd seen, reliving it. Okay. So we have the prosecution case. The prosecution case is he found the body and we say that he knew where it was and he led everybody to it. Somebody smelled a log burner going on at his house. We have an eyewitness who says that he and Jody met up um, and the alibi is not as strong as it yeah. would appear. They accused his mother of burning evidence, destroying evidence. However, they later dropped the charges against her. The, so, charges, the charges were actually about um, the alibi, not about the burning about, the clothes. So they never even charged her with burning no. the clothes? No, no. It was about and, lying to give an alibi. And you say that the log burner was forensically examined. There was yes. no evidence at all, no evidence of Jody's blood, no evidence mm -hmm. of Jody's DNA hair, no evidence mm -hmm. of the burned clothes. Nope. Nothing in there. No. Okay, so let's move on to now looking at the um, information which you say badly undermines the prosecution case. And I want to start with the lack of evidence which actually ties Luke to the scene. So this case has been reinvestigated by former police officers who are now yeah. private investigators. They featured in the... Um, Channel 5 documentary, which was called Murder in a Small Town in 2021. And they identified by going through the original police case files a number of issues with um, the forensic evidence. So the first thing is that there was material in the police documents suggesting that Jody had struggled or fought with her attacker, that she had oh, put up God. a fight. So the killer, whoever was the killer, you would expect them to have defensive wounds yes luke did not have any defensive wounds on his no. body when he was taken by the police on the day that he found the body no nothing whoever killed jody because she had been mutilated so catastrophically and her throat had been slashed blood would have been spraying everywhere whoever killed her would have been soaked in blood covered yes. in blood there is luke would have had to walk back to his house this was the middle of summer she was killed, it's alleged, in the early evening. Yeah. She would have to have been for um, Luke to have then done everything that they say he did, destroyed all the evidence. So he would have had to have walked home in rush hour through a residential yeah. neighborhood in broad daylight, soaked head to toe in blood without anybody noticing. Yeah. On the night that he was taken to the police station after finding her body, the police swabbed underneath his fingernails and there mm. was dirt underneath his fingernails suggesting mm. that he had not recently washed and there was no blood and no DNA under his fingernails no. connecting him to the crime. Nothing. It was also observed in the police documents that when he was taken to the police station that night, he had unwashed greasy hair mm -hmm. and yet there was no evidence of blood, nothing in his hair which could connect him to the crime. No. Yep. They raided his home on the 4th, a few days later. They found no forensic evidence at all there, which linked him to the crime. Nope. So um, now some might say, um, well, there had been a few days by then for him to have cleaned up. But if we just look at the, the thoroughness of what the police do when they forensically examine a scene. So when Luke gets home covered in blood, he would have been treading blood all over the floor. He would have left blood on the door handle when he got home. He would have left blood on every door handle, the bathroom door handle, the bedroom door handle, every handle he touched. The taps, when he switched the taps on to wash himself, yeah. whatever brushes or flannels he used or sponges to try and clean himself would have been covered in blood or certainly would have had traces of blood on them. And usually 
in a case like this, the police will even remove the U-bend in the sinks yeah. or the bath and will actually go through the pipes and check whether there's any DNA in the pipes. In To your knowledge, was all of that done in this case? With the exception of the U-bends. Okay, so the taps were examined, shower, yes. floor, door handles. Mm -hmm. Not a single, not one microscopic trace of Jody's blood found anywhere in the house. No. Was Luke forensically trained? <laughs> at, no. At age 40, was his mother forensically trained? No. Was anybody in his family forensically trained? No. Okay. Um, the other thing is there's no evidence at the scene which links him to the scene. Um, so there's no, uh, there's none of his blood at the scene. Presumably they scraped underneath Jody's fingernails uh, because she had put up a fight and whoever had attacked her would have had defensive wounds. So there's nothing under her fingernails that links Luke to the... No, they, they, made, they made a bit of a mess of the, the fingernail scrapings. Um, they only got results for one hand, but the results that they did get for one hand, for that one hand, didn't, nothing matched to Luke there. Now, it's said in the TV show, and I should say at this point, that the family of Jody are very fervently of the opinion that Luke is the killer, and they yes. were extremely unhappy about their TV show. Yes. And they described it as being full of half half truths. Um, but in the TV show, it is said that hair, saliva, semen and blood were all recovered from the scene. And none of it could be traced back to Luke. No. Nope. Is that correct? That's absolutely true. None of it. So what was the saliva? Who what, Was it a, a different person's saliva that was found on Jody's body? To this day, we don't know whose saliva okay. that was. And and that's the other thing about Luke being forensically aware. Um, you would have to believe that he was able to, to remove all traces of his own DNA from the scene, but leave DNA from other males there. Because there is a full male DNA profile on Jodie's T-shirt. It belongs yes, to so, his boyfriend. Yeah, and that was explained in court by they said that she had borrowed her sister's t-shirt which had the dna on it already and um we're not suggesting that he is uh the killer in any way um her sister's boyfriend um so i'm just trying to imagine a way in which you could i'm looking at the timings of it so luke would have had to have killed jody and then walked home in broad daylight through the um, residential neighborhood at rush hour without anybody seeing him. And then somehow completely erased all forensic trace of the crime on himself without washing. We know he didn't wash because it's in the police report. There's also the case of the missing weapon. So they never found the murder weapon. Yeah. So also in this timeline you would have to account for Luke getting somewhere and disposing of the murder weapon before he then goes home and cleans himself up and burns all the evidence and then gets uh, well, back out. They, they did try to suggest at one point that actually he'd taken the murder weapon home with him and he'd gone out to walk his dog at 10 o'clock at night to get rid of the, the murder weapon then. Uh, but did, did they search the area for the murder weapon? I mean, are they, how far are they suggesting he walked the dog to dispose of the weapon? Well, yeah, they, they took the local area apart. They had they had people in the divers in the rivers. And they didn't stop the bins being emptied, oddly enough. Um, but they, you know, they, they had the whole area cordoned off, the, the path area. They, they searched all the woodlands and everything, looking for the murder weapon and never found it. So it's built into the timeline somewhere is the disposal of the weapon somewhere in the local area that then gets searched and they don't find it. Yeah. I, I should okay. point out as well, the, the, you've got the murder. The police said Jody died at 5.15. This was just a, a random time. It, it, it was, they, they were looking for a window of opportunity when Luke could have, been, could have been the killer. But immediately after that, they claimed that the killer then stripped Jody's clothes off 
tied her arms behind her back with her trousers and mutilated her body. So you'd have to build that into the timeline as well. And Sorry, this... are they saying they they that that was done before or after she was initially killed? After. So, so she so was she... killed and then that was done? Yes. Yes. So the, there was this fight. She was beaten. Her hair was pulled out. Um, various injuries inflicted prior to the cutthroat injuries, which the police set at 5.15. After the cutthroat injuries, the body was stripped, her arms tied behind her back, and, and the, the mutilation injuries inflicted at that point. And, and still they claimed in court that the, the killer would not necessarily be covered in blood. So, so you got from 5.15 to 10 to 6, approximately 10 to 6, when Luke was seen sitting on a wall at the end of the street. So 5.15, the, the cutthroat. Then you've got all the aftermath. Then you've got he's got to get home, get cleaned up. And by between 10 to 6 and 5 to 6, he's sitting on a wall at the end of his street. So does Luke accept that that is him sat on the wall? Yes. Yes. And it, how it, does that marry in with his... At what time was his alibi that his mother and his brother gave him? I... Uh, 515. He, he came in. It's quite difficult because they, they keep moving the goalposts, but um from five o'clock ish to five thirty ish. About ten to ten to five to five thirty. So his brother came in at ten to five. His mum came in at five fifteen. Luke left the house just after half past five to go and wait for Jody. So that is the period of the alibi which matches the, the 5.15 time of death. So he was going to go and meet her, but somewhere close to his house. Yes. Okay. Now, um, there's this call, because one thing that they raised in the prosecution case as part of undermining the alibi was that there was a phone call that was made from his phone to the talking clock, from his mobile phone to the talking clock. And they said that this contradicted his alibi and demonstrated that he was not at home, because if he was at home, he would have just looked at a clock. So he must have been out and about and made the phone call to find out what time it was, perhaps yeah. suggesting that he made the call on his way to meet Jody. Um, what time was that phone call to 4 talk? 4.54. 4 4.54. And so... Um, his case effectively is I was at home and I just lazily called the talking clock. Is that is that essentially his case? Yeah. The the defense got the phone records and Luke had a habit of randomly calling the speaking clock round about eight between eight and eight thirty in the morning before he left for school and somewhere between sort of half four, five o'clock when he came in from school. So there was something like eighteen calls to the speaking clock in the lead up to that night. The other issue they've got with it is the eyewitness that said she saw Jodie and Luke. And by the way, her, her original description was nothing like Jodie and Luke. The guy was uh, early 20s with thick hair standing up in a clump. You've seen Luke's hair, poker straight, and he, he definitely didn't look early 20s. Anyway, I digress. Um, her sighting was 449 to 454 ostensibly and the guy's hands are out in front of him at his sides out in front of him no mention of a mobile phone at exactly the time Luke's calling the speaking clock okay I just want to run something by you as well while I think mm -hmm. of it there's a, an article that was published by the daily record which was called something like the these this is the evidence which proves that Luke Mitchell is the killer Ten and five. they Yes, so they disputed the suggestion that there was no forensic evidence tying yes. him to the crime scene. They said his DNA was found on Jody's bra mm -hmm. and her DNA was found on his trousers. Mm -hmm. So what is the full context around that evidence? The There was a mixed DNA sample on Jody's bra. The bra she was wearing that day? Yes. Okay. The expert said that Luke Mitchell could not be excluded as a contributor to that mixture. That doesn't mean Luke Mitchell was a contributor. 
It just means parts of his profile matched up with parts of the mixture on the bra. And what I did was I got the DNA results and I had a look at how many other people that statement would be true for, could not be excluded. And there are several males known to the investigation, including the senior investigating officer, that the same would be true of, because you can't use a partial as, as, as an identification. So it's not it is not factually correct to no. say that his DNA was found on the bra. No. And, and when and they the said... Record, sorry. Yeah, sorry. No, go ahead. The, the daily record give that side of it. What they don't say is that the defence forced that witness to admit on the stand that in no way could that mixed profile identify Luke or anybody else. And they never report that bit. What about Jody's DNA on um, on Luke's trousers? These was that were, the trousers they, he was wearing that day? No, these were a pair of trousers that were in a hold all from when he'd been visiting his dad because his mum and dad were separated and he, he sometimes stayed with his dad at the weekend. So these were in a pair of in a, a hold all that had come back from his dad's. And it was agreed between the prosecution and the defence that th there was no suggestion that these were, these trousers were in any way connected to the murder. And, you know, so it's just his girlfriend's DNA was on a pair of trousers that he owned, yeah. which is something you would fully expect. Yeah. So another element that has come to light about this investigation subsequently is the unfair way in which Luke was treated um, from the outset of the investigation. And that's not an opinion. That is something that a court has ruled. A court has ruled that he was treated unfairly. Yeah. So he was taken to a police station where he asked for a lawyer and he was told he was not entitled to one. Yeah. which would be bad enough if he was an adult, but he was a child. Yeah. He was then questioned for hours in a very aggressive way by police officers with no appropriate adult or no lawyer present. There and was an appropriate adult, but he never opened his mouth throughout the entire... Who was the appropriate... Because he asked for his mother, didn't he? So who was the appropriate adult? It was a social worker. Okay. And the only time he spoke in the whole interrogation was to say his name. But no lawyer. He asked for a lawyer and he wasn't given one. No, that was legal in Scotland in 2003. Oh, really? That was legal yeah. at the time? Yeah, they were called Section 14 interviews and they were legal. They're not anymore. Okay, and a, nonetheless, a judge has subsequently ruled, and I'm quoting directly here, that Luke's behavior, Luke, the, the officer's behaviour towards Luke was outrageous, hostile, and that they were endeavouring to break him down into giving some hoped-for confession, and their conduct could only be described as deplorable. Yes. And I believe it even extended to when he was taken to the bathroom, because he needed to use the bathroom, the police officers followed him into the bathroom and stood over him as he was using the toilet and continued to shout at him and instruct him that he, ne he needed to confess. Yeah. Now, it's worth mentioning that in subsequent years, Luke's mother underwent a polygraph test where she was asked explicitly, did you fabricate the alibi? Did you destroy any evidence? She answered no, and she passed that polygraph. Yes. Luke in prison has undergone a polygraph where he was asked explicitly a series of questions about whether he was in any way involved in Jody's killing. And he passed that polygraph yeah. as well. Now, a polygraph is not admissible in court no. um, because they do not have a 100% success rate, but they do have a relatively high success yeah. rate. Um, you are a criminologist. What is the significance to you of the two of them passing those polygraph tests? There are a couple of, I was going to say there's two, there's a couple of elements to um the, the significance. The first is obviously if you take the odds of one passing without knowing what the questions were going to be in, in advance and then the odds of both of them passing without knowing what the questions were going to be and with no way of discussing with each other what they might be, that that for me takes the, the likelihood that they're telling the truth really quite high in that you know, for both of them to pass and not slip up on anything if they were lying. Um, 
one of the other things is lots of people have said, you know, um, the, the polygraph side of things could have been biased because we paid for the polygraphs. Well, we didn't. It was media outlets that paid for the polygraphs. And Luke and Corinne agreed to take these tests knowing that the results would go out in the media no matter what they were. Now, that's a massive risk if they were lying. Knowing that the, the media, the media paid for them, the media were going to print the results. And they were both willing to take that risk, which to me suggests it wasn't a risk to them at all. They knew they were going to pass. And there are some other suspects who have come to light over the years, other people who were known to the police as potential suspects, but for whatever reason, the police had decided early on that it was Luke and they didn't really appear to have invested much investigative resource into looking into these other suspects. Now, one thing that leaps out at the scene, the police discovered a condom which contained what was described in the police reports as fresh semen. Yes. What is your understanding as to how recent it would have to have been to be described as fresh semen? Um, well, it breaks down fairly, fairly quickly. Um, so, so for it to be described as fresh, I would have said between within for, 24 hours before it, okay. it started to degrade. Now, three years after that, something pings on a police computer because the DNA profile which is extracted from this fresh semen found at the crime scene, um, the person whose DNA it was has now gone back into the police system and they have an identification of that person. Do you know what it was that had happened for that person's DNA to go back into the system three years later? I believe it was an assault charge. Okay. What Do you know if that person was questioned in relation to Jodie's? I know that uh, Luke, by that point, was already in prison. But did the police follow that up? Did they go and question the person? They did. And his story was that... He'd gone down the path, down behind the wall, into the woodland strip that night to masturbate because he had no privacy at home. Um, he then told the police that the following morning when he saw the police tape and all the police officers and the helicopter and everything, he went back out into the wasteland at the other end of the path and did the same. And the police said, yeah, OK, thanks for that. Off you go. Did he give any explanation as to why he was masturbating into a condom? No. Hmm. Okay. So, um, the Daily Record says that there is no evidence that Jody was sexually assaulted. Yes. Is that correct? I think it depends on what you want to define as sexual assault. Or she was stripped naked. Yeah, and her breast was mutilated. Is that... So, you're a criminologist. Does that sound like a potentially sexually motivated killing? Yes, and I think I think people have to understand the difference between a sexual, a sexual crime and a sexually motivated crime. And this is what the, the, daily, the daily record never differentiates between the two. Even the police themselves initially believed it was a sexually motivated crime. And we, we did have evidence um, from a, a forensic, not a forensic, a, a psychologist um, pointing towards peakerism, which is basically when the, the attacker, the murderer, gets their sexual gratification from stabbing and cutting. Is so, that, sorry, is that something you obtained or something the police obtained? No, that was something we obtained afterwards. But there's... As evidence in the contemporaneous police investigation files that they at the time considered it to be a sexually motivated yes. crime. Yes. And then they changed they changed it later and said it wasn't there was no sexual assault and dropped their claim that it was sexually motivated, which is the most bizarre the most bizarre thing ever. But 
that's what we're left with now, unfortunately. There's a second alternative suspect, which is a man who is deceased, so we can name him. His name is Mark Kane. Yeah. And it was said that he, on the day after Jody's killing, was seen by people with uh, scratches to his face. Yes. Was questioned as to how he had obtained those scratches, and his answer was that he had taken some drugs or or alcohol or both and had gone into the exact woodland where Jody's body was found, but he denied involvement in crime. Yeah, he, um, he couldn't remember anything about that night. Now, one of the witnesses was a guy called Scott Forbes, yeah. and at the Court of Appeal, his testimony was dismissed, um, and I believe it emerged that uh, one of the things that was used to discredit him was that he had tried to sell a story to a newspaper. Is that right? Yeah, this story comes up over and over again. It's entirely untrue. But am I not right in thinking that he was not the only person that saw the scratches? He was yes. not the only person that Mark Kane told he was in the woods. There were other people who came forward and said, I yes. saw the scratches on his face. He told me he was in the woods. Yes. How many witnesses came forward and said that? Let me see, we had one, two, three, at least another four. Including... So you've got five witnesses, including Scott Forbes, or four, including Scott Forbes. Five, including Scott. So Scott Five, including there. Scott Forbes. So even if Mr. Forbes had been discredited, it would still leave four witnesses saying the same thing. Yeah. Now, um, Sorry, so what is the truth about Mr. Forbes and the selling of the story? The claim that, that came up at appeal was that um, he'd said to Mark Kane that Mark Kane should go to the police and tell them that he was in the woods that night and he had scratches on his face and he couldn't remember what he'd, what he'd been doing. And when the police cleared him, they would tell, take the story to the newspapers and get 50 grand and split it between them. Now, I don't know what sort of lunatic you would have to be to, to agree to that, that particular <laughs> plan, but there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that a plan like that ever existed and, and Mr. Kane would be taking an enormous risk to, to have gone along with that. So did that story come from Mr. Kane? He said that. He's denied that it came from him. So who made that claim to the court about it was the splitting made, of the money? It was made by the, the Crown at the appeal. But we they didn't they didn't really say where they got it from. Okay. There's a some third a third alternative suspects. Um we're gonna refer to them as moped boys mm -hmm. because there were witnesses who saw some boys in the area on mopeds at the time. And there was one witness, I believe, who said that they saw a moped leaned up against a fence close to the crime scene, but could not see the rider or riders. And when those witnesses were questioned about where they had been when their moped was leaned up against a fence near the crime scene at the time the crime would have been occurring, they said they couldn't remember. Is that all correct? Yeah, the the bike, the, the moped was actually at, at the V point in the wall, the V break in the wall, at exactly five fifteen. And the the V point in the wall, just to say, that is the same place where Luke climbed over, isn't it, yes. or where he was when the dog started indicating and saying that, yes. and, and they discovered the body. Okay. Um, however, they testified in a trial. Um, the police have never concluded that they are the killer. Um, they deny being the killer. Yeah. And there's no evidence, physical, like DNA or anything, that implicates them in the crime in any way. Um, it's just this unexplained sighting of them in the area at the time. And yeah. the police they, didn't really... take five days to come forward, and one of them is Jodie's cousin, who told the police... They hadn't come forward because his gran, which is Jodie's gran, had told them not to. Because the time they were on the path was too early for them to have seen anything. 
but they also lied about the time they were on the path. So when you say lied, um, is it possible they were mistaken? What do you mean when you say they lied? They put themselves on the path about 45 minutes earlier than they were actually there. And they claimed that was because there was a, a, a clock in the house that they'd left from that was at the wrong time, which that would be reasonable, except that there are a number of other events that afternoon that they were bang on time for that they would have had to be using that clock. So so one of them had a, a an interview at the job centre and he was there on time. And this is, you know, an hour before the clock's at the wrong time and puts them 45 minutes earlier on the path. The other one said what time he came to this house earlier in the day, and that's bang on time as well. So, so either this clock went nuts in the space of an hour to put them there 45 minutes earlier, or they lied. So, and the importantly, only even if we assume for the sake of argument that Luke is innocent and that, that all these other alternative suspects, they can't all have done it. So yeah. we're not saying any of these people are the killer, but at the very least, you would have thought that the police would have devoted a bit more investigative resource to checking out some anomalies in their stories or why somebody had deposited fresh semen at the yeah. scene of a murder, for example. Now, there's one other alternative suspect who has been cited by um, Luke's defence and the campaign to overturn his conviction, who we won't name, um, but it's an individual who was known to Jody and had connections to the area. Um, can you just talk about the, uh, the reasons that that individual is a potential suspect in your opinion? We found out um, after Luke was convicted that this person had, in the run-up to the murder, had serious, serious mental health problems and was on the highest um, dosage of antipsychotic medication, but was still massively abusing cannabis. So the antipsychotic medication wasn't working. It had a, a number of episodes in, in the six months prior to Jodie's murder, um, was known to, when, when he had episodes, was known to be extremely violent, had used bladed instruments in the past, and was, was not considered a suspect, but was not even formally questioned because he was so mentally ill, he was not well enough to be formally questioned. And, and so and that, that would suggest that the police had had some internal discussions about questioning this person, but decided they couldn't do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so they never pursued, so they just never pursued it because they couldn't question no. the person. No, never pursued it. So in recent years, you have tried to um, gain access to forensic evidence with a view to retesting it. Yeah. Presumably, in part, because you want to see if any forensic evidence subjected to fresh testing would implicate any of these other suspects. You one, one of the things that I think people find almost unbelievable when I tell them this is the vast majority of the male DNA from semen or sperm heads came back no reportable result test after test after test, item after item after item after item. And that's why we wanted to get some of these retested because that, that, seems, that seems unusual that there are so many tests that turned up nothing. And presumably the testing today will be far more sophisticated yes. than the testing 20 years ago. Yes. Um, now, unfortunately, when you try to gain access to this evidence, you discovered that the establishment was in the process of destroying it all yes. um, despite it being very well documented that Luke challenges his conviction um, does not accept his guilt and it being highly probable that he would mount further appeals in the future 
So can you just talk us through how you discovered that this evidence was being destroyed by the state? We were actually alerted by a whistleblower that they were starting to destroy the evidence. So Luke's lawyer wrote to them and they admitted that, yes, they had started destroying it. And then as, as we as we sort of followed that down the line, um, the, the Crown Office and the police were kind of throwing each other under the bus and the Crown Office were saying, no, we didn't give them permission. The police were saying, yeah, it was them. But what we did discover was around the, the Crown had given permission for destruction of um, the productions that were on the indictment. So, so the stuff that, that was used at trial. The police went ahead and destroyed 1600 productions that were not covered by that instruction. What's so, a production? Sorry for those of us not so in the know. Pieces of evidence that are used at trial or that are used to build the case. Um, so Jodie's clothing, uh, recordings of interviews, you know, any, anything that they used as, as evidence and anything that, that they didn't actually specifically use in at trial, they were not to destroy. Or Why made. would they have authorised the destruction of the material that was used at trial, though? I don't understand. What, I, I have no idea. Why would you say you can destroy all the evidence that we used to convict him, but you can't destroy anything else? Because you would think that would be the most important evidence, wouldn't you? Think about it. it may have been the other way around. They might have said they could destroy the stuff not in the indictment. But either way, they destroyed everything, regardless of what the instruction was. Um, You've just used the, the figure 1,600, but in private eye recently it was reported it was over 3,000 items. Is that That's incorrect? in total. That's okay, in total. right. 1,600 that they had, they had no permission to destroy. Oh, so they, they destroyed over 3,000 pieces of evidence, including in 1,600 pieces, which they were not authorised to destroy. Yes. yes. Now, remarkably, among this evidence apparently are 10 semen deposits which were taken from Jody's body. So there was semen on Jody's body and it was never tested. Yeah. That just seems unfathomable. Um, yeah. Did you know that this existed before this all happened? Um, no. We when, when we discovered that there were samples left, there was a file that was marked not on main inventory, forensics, not on main inventory. And when we got into this file, when, I was talking about productions earlier, and just so that people understand, um, when items are collected, they're given a, a unique reference number so that they can be followed through the entire investigation and through to trial and appeal if necessary. In this file, not one of the samples in there had a reference number. Not one. And we found samples in there that basically the defence knew nothing about. Were they disclosed to the defence but marked in such a way that they seemed irrelevant or were they simply not disclosed to the defence? A large number of them were never disclosed at all, is what we're discovering now. And some of them like you say, may have been disclosed, but in such a way that, that you, you would never have recognised that they were significant at all. And what about these 10 semen deposits on Jodie's body? Were they disclosed or undisclosed? They weren't disclosed as semen deposits as such. They were, they were, they were in a list of no results great big list of no results stuff and they were just in that list so so we didn't know what we got no results for we just had no results it just said tests brought no results and then when we got into this this hidden file we realized that the initially they've tested positive for semen and then never been tested any further just been put into this other file and left there for 20 years. I mean, 
if what is your opinion of the fact that this was not flagged up to the defense as something important? Oh, I mean, <laughs> this is not just Luke's life we're talking about here. This is this was about justice for Jody and whoever did this to Jody. It's it's beyond despicable that that stuff was hidden in order to obtain a conviction rather than to rather than to get the right person is the way I look at it. What will you do if those semen deposits are retested? Are they are they are they um they're among the evidence that was not destroyed, is that right? Yes. Yes. So what will you do if they're tested and they come back to Luke Mitchell? So be it. So be it. Then we will know the truth. And that's so all is, I've been looking for for 20 years is the truth. Do you, is, I just want to be clear. Do we know that the semen deposit, I mean, I don't know. I'm not forensically trained, right? So how long would semen, because Luke and Jody were boyfriend and girlfriend. Yes. So how significant would it be that, must these see because you said something about it starts to break down very quickly so must these semen deposits have been left by the killer or not almost certainly almost okay. certainly. You've, got, you've got to remember that jody was left out in the rain her body was left out in the rain all night naked so they didn't put a, a cover over her, they didn't put a tent up or anything um so whatever whatever deposits are on her body are most likely to have been from most likely to have been deposited there after she was stripped they're, they're unlikely to have been so for example it was claimed that she had a bath on the sunday evening and she, she obviously she washed before she went out to school on on the monday morning um so had there been deposits from sexual intercourse with luke which she had on saturday night that would all have been washed away and this is the Monday evening. So essentially what the what the, the scientists are telling us is that the deposits on her body were from the last person who had contact with her body. How close are you to Luke? That's a strange question. Um, well, I just mean, do you, are you um do you speak to him regularly? How would yes. you feel if it turned out? That he'd been wasting your time for 20 years. Oh, I guess I'd be a bit annoyed. But I, I would have no regrets for anything that I've done in these 20 years because there are so many unanswered questions in this case that you can't say justice has been properly done for Jody. You can't. So even if he turns out to be the killer, yeah. the investigation will still in your opinion have been catastrophically flawed essentially yes. and worthy of scrutiny yes and probing so is your uh belief you know luke like obviously i've never spoken to him do you feel confident that he is not the killer as confident as as anybody can be that wasn't actually there yeah you know, i can never 100 percent say he definitely didn't do it but from everything I've seen in terms of evidence over the years, and I'm not basing this on Luke's personality, in terms of evidence over the years, there is nothing there to suggest it was him. And the type of personality switch that would that would be needed as well, um, because it, well, first of all, they said it was a frenzied attack, then they said the killer became icily calm for, for the mutilations and everything. Um, I've, I've never seen, any indication of personality or mood shifts like that from boy to man in, in the 20 years I've known him. But my my opinion is based on the evidence that I've seen over the years. There's a, a website online where uh, the authors of that website are quite committed to attacking Luke and attacking your investigation into uh, Luke's conviction and they quite regularly cite a Daily Mail article from 2005 where it was said that Luke had a history of pulling knives on girls. Um, have you ever asked Luke about that and what the veracity is of that claim? Yes, yes, discussed it many times. Um, 
th this history of pulling knives on girls came from girls who came forward after the conviction and made claims um, about things that Luke had allegedly done. One claimed that he pulled a knife on her at the army cadets before Jodie's murder. And I had, I've probably still got them somewhere, the army cadet attendance records. And Luke had already left cadets by the time this, this girl said it happened. She could have been mistaken about the date, fair enough, but he'd already left the cadets by then. The other um, girl who I believe claimed this happened when she was 11 in this particular house. Um, I have spoken to the adults surrounding that. I have to be very careful because I don't want to identify any of the people involved here, but I have spoken to the adults surrounding that and they are of the opinion that it didn't happen. Now, if, if, you, had, if you had a daughter who suddenly came out with something like that. I know, I know if, if one of my daughters had come out with something like that, I'd have been right on it there and then. But I, from from the parents and, and the adults surrounding it, I got the, the distinct impression that it was fantasy. Was the, because the male shouldn't really have been talking to somebody of that age. Were they older by the time the male spoke to them, do you know? I don't think the male spoke to that particular girl. Right. The the, the one that he spoke to was over 16. Okay. Do you know how the information made its way to the male then? I presume the... I don't know. I don't know. I, I can't, I'm not even going to try and guess. Do you... Um... There was some criticism in the TV show, which I should say again, Jodie's family believe very fervently that Luke is the killer, and they say that his constant denials and his attempts to get out of prison are a way of re-traumatizing them, and that they um, feel attacked by him constantly denying that he is the killer and that he is sort of uh, harassing them from behind the prison bars. Um Do you, but do you the, there was criticism in that TV show, which has itself been criticized by the family of the relationship between the media and the police that there seem to be leaks going yes. on. Um, do, have you looked into that? Have you looked into that as a potential corruption? Um, I mean, there's a, a, a number of things that have gone on in this case that we know are not right. For example, the judge who found that Luke's treatment by the police was completely improper. Um, how much mileage is there for you in pursuing any kind of complaints about the police? Or is that something that you would only worry about once the conviction is dealt with? Probably once the conviction is dealt with. You have to, you have to pick your fights in this work. Um, and, and in, in particular, because for a very long time, I was the only one working on this case. So, so you've got to decide what is, what is the most important thing to pursue right now. And for me, the most important thing to pursue is the truth about what happened to Jodie and who was responsible. If, everything so, else can be sorted out after that is the way I look at it. Who's working on the case now? How many people does Luke have? fighting for him does he have a, a lawyer or a team of lawyers we have a lawyer at the minute um we have a couple of legal experts working behind the scenes um we're just about to engage some forensic experts um and that's that's pretty much it at the minute it's because there's there's no there's no money to pay for the sort of stuff that we need to to take this forward, you know, the, the, the legal aid that would be available would not pay for the, the people that we need. So we've been very fortunate because we do have some people working for free and, and given their expertise for free to allow us to pull this together in order to take it forward. And what happens next? I mean, so you've got these exhibits, some of which were not disclosed to you or were disclosed in a way that sort of disguised how significant they were. 
for example, semen retrieved from Jody's body. So um, how long is it likely to be before you can get that tested? And then once you've got it tested, what happens next? So the Police Scotland gave us an, un an undertaking that they would, they would do nothing with these samples so that we could apply for them to get them tested. Then they came back and said they were going to put these restrictions on what we could have and how it could be tested and where it could be tested. So we had to argue that and, you know, get the agreement that, no, we'll get a forensic scientist to tell you what we want and why we want it and have it tested independently. While we were doing that, we got information to say that the police had moved the samples to a forensic lab, which is a moment of, uh-oh, why would they do that? But when, when we went to the place that we'd been told the samples had been, had been moved to, they denied it. They said, no, no, we, we don't have them. The police said, no, we didn't. We didn't send them there. So now we're kind of sitting there going, we don't know actually who's got the samples. But what we will do is once we have the, the scientific report saying which samples we need and why we need them, that will go initially to Police Scotland with whom we have the undertaking to do nothing with them until we get them for testing. So that will be the next stage. I don't know how long that will take. I don't know how long the testing will take because we don't actually have a finalised list yet. Once all of that's done, that then goes into a new application to the SCCRC because you can't just go straight back to the Court of Appeal. We have to ask the Commission to do another review of the case based on what we've found and then they have to decide whether the case gets referred back to the Court of Appeal or not. And then the Court of Appeal has to decide whether they're going to overturn the conviction or not. So there's still a number of steps to go. So realistically, we're probably looking at years more of Luke being in prison before this is all dealt with. It, at least another couple. Yeah, yeah. He would have been and due to release in April 2024 if, if, if he admitted if he, it. Yeah. But he says he'll never admit it. He nope. says he he won't confess to something he didn't do. Nope. So and he's has he's on record as saying he will die in prison rather than confess. Yeah. And how old is he now? Thirty five, thirty six. Hmm. Now you've um you've written a book about the case, haven't you? Yes. What's the book called, and and where can people find it? It's called Innocent Betrayed. So yeah, there you go, TS. Um, it is available on, available on Amazon at the minute, but they have hiked the price to something ridiculous. Some of them are selling for 40 pounds. So uh, I think I, I, I gave Jamil an email address where people can contact me directly if they would like a copy of the book at the proper price, and I'll just sign it and send it out to them if they want to do it that way. Do you want to um, give that email address out now while we're on the air? Uh... Yeah, if I can remember, it's a, uh, yeah, I think it's just innocence.betrayed at gmail.com. Well, thank you very much for um, for joining us today. Uh, I suppose before we wrap up, I should ask, how is, um, how is Luke doing? How is he coping? He's, he's doing extremely well. I saw him yesterday. Uh, I was out to visit him yesterday. He's, he's very, very strong. He's very focused. So because the, there's stuff been going on with the prison as well, um, I've got him dealing with that as best he can while I'm working on the on the actual conviction stuff. Um, but he's, he's, he's incredibly strong. Surprisingly, still has a sense of humour in spite of all of this. Um, and he, he's just, he's absolutely determined to, to have his name cleared and to find out what happened and who did this well thank you very much for for joining us today and um this will be available on catch up as well and uh it was a very interesting discussion it's a fascinating case and um please keep us posted on the next steps thank you thank you so much for for giving me the time to have this conversation thank you for tuning in everyone this has been um talking true crime for nq investigates and uh, we'll see you again soon with another case.